This is the Ascension Football Show. I'm Joel Villafano. We take a trip down memory lane today. Former national captain. He took us within a whisker of qualifying for the finals of the CONCACAF Gold Cup. He was a midfield general. Made a bold decision to run for the FIFA presidency. Now, he's deep into the politics of TNT as an opposition senator. David Nakid is here. Today we are doing fitness with the ball and without the ball. You have to be as detailed as you can be when you speak to your stakeholders. Big show for you today as we continue to delve deeper into national football here. It's in a state of what you can simply call disrepair. And we seek to get the answers here on the Ascension Football Show. As I tease to the top, he was voted most valuable player countless number of times across Europe and the Middle East. Three-time MVP for what was then known as the Caribbean Shell Cup. Memorable days in football here in TNT. 1994, 95, and 97. I recall, even as a player, David Nakid was known to speak his mind. Over the years covering him, I've never really heard him sugarcoat anything. Let's hope he stays true to that today. <laughs> With me, I'm happy to have former national captain and midfielder David Nakid. My brother, thank you very nice much. Nice to be here. here. Thanks, for, thanks for inviting me. Um, David, I wish we would be meeting in more favorable times. We're in the middle of a pandemic. Football is up, down, everywhere, topsy-turvy. Um, and, and we have difficult, difficult decisions, difficult things that lie ahead where football is concerned. But before we go into the nitty-gritty of that, I just want to take it down memory lane a little bit. I don't think, I don't, I don't, I don't know if trying to make whatever heard you down memory lane, you know, relive some of those glorious moments over the period of time. Um, take us back to early days, first of all. Um, and I'm talking early days in terms of growing up along the East West Corridor. Mongdo, I think you were. Yes, you, I'm. I'm, I'm we are. We are Naked families from St. Joseph. St. Joseph. But we grew up in Champlain. Right. Right. In Mongdo Road, uh, 16th West Private Road. And um, my early football began there with a team called Santos. Santos FC was a, a famous team in the Eddie Art League. So actually, although I went to St. Mary's, I was not allowed to play football for my father, um, who was very much into education. All my sisters, brothers and sisters are professionals. And I was the only one who played any kind of sport. And um, I, would have to, I was not allowed to play at St. Mary's College. So I would have to run away when I got home and go with the boys from up Mongdo Road, because we were lower Mongdo Road. I'd have to go with them, sneak away to go play in the hard league. So I was playing with big men from the age of 14, 15. So by the time I passed, I went through to Form 6, and I was allowed then to play. Um, reluctantly, but I was allowed to play. I was already playing with big men. So, you know, colleges league was not easy, but it was... Um, it was a breeze. It was, it was, <laughs> we did well. Yeah, yeah, we did, yeah. We did well, you know. We had a good team, and we, we pushed all the way against, you know, Big men from St. Augustine and John D. Men who, people who were 19, 20, and we were 16, 17. And, you know, we handled ourselves well. Memorable days back in those Yeah, extremely. Yeah, 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 extremely. Yeah. You know, playing with Barry Henderson and Dexter Skeen and Kurt Hernandez and Stephen Troy. And, you know, we had a really good team. You, you, you did a little local stint here playing for some club teams. Uh, I think you would have spent some time at Caledonia, yeah, yeah, Joe Public. Tell me about actually playing locally here. Uh, well, yeah. playing locally here, I played in Joe Public when I was banned in from in worldwide. I was banned because when I supported the the African players in in Lebanon, I so I played with Joe Public for a bit. I played with Caledonia sometimes in between clubs in Europe, right. 
um, because I was a supporter, financial supporter of Caledonia. Right. You know, Jamal Shabazz is a, a childhood friend of mine, and still is. And um, I played with them. I remember when they had to win a game to go through to the Caribbean Cup Finals. I came and played a game with them against a Barbados team, and we beat them two 0 or something. Yeah. You know, so I've been always been a supporter. Of, I would send uniforms and balls and clothes, you know, equipment. Um, so, other than that, I played for Maple. Um, when I left St. Mary's, we played for Maple, as most St. Mary's men did back then, because of the Alvin Cornell, Sally Joseph connection. So, I had good days playing in the Savannah back then. Back then, you know, there weren't very many good fields, and to play in the stadium was like, you know, paradise for us. So um, there were good days because we had an enormous pool of talent throughout Trinidad and Tobago. There was not any village in Trinidad and Tobago. You couldn't find five or six players who could represent the national team, and competently so. So um, they were enjoyable in terms of the level of competition. But to, to your remark earlier, football administratively was always in a state of flux. Let's be honest. There, there have never been any, there's never been some kind of consensus that we could rally around or some kind of, of ethos that all of us could rally around and say, you know, we're good. We had at times autocratic people like Jack Warner and so, who he himself would admit he was very much a di dictatorial style. And we've had sheer incompetence as we see, as we see now. Um, and in between, we have a mix of the two. So uh, uh, to that point, it will, there were good days. I think we'll get into that yeah, uh, in, in detail. Yeah. I, he, he doesn't sugarcoat and he wants to, to, take, to take my sugar, just the <laughs> sugar I wanted to sweeten up the segment. <laughs> well, uh, go I, want, I want to look back at the 2000 Gold Cup. I want to look back at your, your playing, your national playing. Ah, uh, okay. You know, um, I, I mean, when, when you look at, I mean, your love for football was, uh, so despite you know, you're not, not getting the opportunity to play as you probably would have wanted as a young man, you quickly developed and became the first import, so to speak, um, on, on the European circuit here in Trinidad and Tobago. For the first export? Yeah. First yeah, I, I was. Um, I left, I played in Europe at a time when no one thought about Europe. Yeah. I mean, back then you could only get certain games on television. It's not like now you could get 100 games at the same time. So when I finished, well, after St. Mary's, I, I went to American University in Washington, D.C., played four years. I was a captain at, in last year, and I won MVP twice. And I was in all selection in many teams. And, but actually, my last year where we went to the, the finals, I was considered probably one of the best midfielders coming out of the United States. I got drafted in the first round by Baltimore Blast. It was the only professional league then. So I played a year that was indoor football. I was quite good. Um, and um, I, I made good money and uh, I saved up and, and went. The first chance I got after playing with Lincoln Phillips' team in, in Maryland and John Kerr's team, I, I left for Europe. I left for Europe because I, I saw some of the English imports we had in America. And uh, I would fight with them all the time because, you know, the English as usual, they thought they were the best, and for me, they won't. And uh, I told, I would tell them that if you played in Europe, I will play in Europe. And they would laugh, you know. You know, people at, at that time didn't know much about Trinidad and Tobago. And to be honest, based on that motivation, I decided I would go and play in Europe. Um, I played a game for Lincoln Phillips team, Maryland Bays, in Florida against a team that had a lot of World Cup stars. It was a league. It was the league, outdoor league in America. And uh, they had Teofilio Cubrias from Peru, captain of Peru. They had Dersu from Brazil. They had a whole host of players, you know. I think the Gonzalez boy from El Salvador. They used to call him El Magic. They had great players on the team. And I won MVP in that game. And um, present there was the FIFA technical director at the time. His name was Walter Gack. And he said he came, he was the one who handed out the MVP of the game. And uh, he spoke with Lincoln and he said, well, who is this player? You know, and, Link, and I think Lincoln said, well, he's a Trinidad player that, and Lincoln also from Trinidad. So he came and he spoke with me and he said, have you considered ever playing in Europe? 
And I told him, as a matter of fact, I, I have. And he had he was a part owner of, on the director's board of Neuchâtel Zamax in Switzerland. And he arranged eventually to bring me over to there, to Zamax. And I, I went over there with the intention of going to Zamax. But I was in Zurich. I flew into Zurich. And while in Zurich, the, the manager of Grasshopper Zurich, Eric Vogel, contacted me to come and just train, just to have a look. And the rest is history. Rest is history. I signed for Grasshoppers. Yeah. After three months, yeah. Otmar Hitzfeld, the great Otmar Hitzfeld, was the coach. And um, he saw me, he gave me 20 minutes. 20 minutes, brother. He gave me 20 minutes. He said, You have 20 minutes to prove yourself. Yeah, on a training pitch. On a training pitch. Mm -hmm. It was the end of the training. 20 minutes against players who were coming back from injury, right. players who hadn't played in the game previously, that kind of thing. So, a small sided game. I didn't pass a ball. Dribble everybody. Because I had 20 minutes. Yeah. And um, from that, he invited me to train with the first team. And after three months, I signed my first professional contract, 1988. In a, in a nutshell, I mean, I know we want to get on to, 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 to the matters at heart, um, but, but you, you went across Europe and across the Middle East and Lebanon, um, and, and as I said, you were pretty successful at, at, at most of the clubs that you went to, as I said, MVP on countless number of occasions across Belgium and, 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 and when you went to Lebanon and so on. Um, that European experience and in the Middle East, how would you describe that in a nutshell in terms of your, the impact on your footballing career? Well, for, for me, it was unbelievable. Yeah, if you remember, I was playing in Europe at that time. You could count how many black players were playing on, your, on one hand. Not like now. I mean, most players, 80%, most teams, 80% uh, are African players or players from the Middle East or, or from the Caribbean. At that time, you could count. I mean, when I played in Switzerland, I remember there was, there was myself and a guy called Aziz Budabala. I remember very well because... We would play against Sion. He, would, he played for Sion. He was a famous World Cup player mm -hmm. from Morocco. And the racism that was coming from the stands, and he and I would be talking and we'd be laughing, you know, the uh, things that you see that people make a, that then was normal, you know, they'd be calling us names and, and stuff. Because he looked pretty much like, you know, North Africans, Moroccans, they look like how I look, you know, red men, mm -hmm. as we would say in Trinidad. And we'd be laughing and, and can play, and we were the best players. It was normal, you know, at that time. Not that we would take it. You couldn't tell me something to my face. But if in the stands, it doesn't affect me. And um, it was wonderful days for me playing in Europe because I know there was no coverage here. Or there's no coverage anywhere about European football at that time. It's not like now what you, you do is immediately on social media. Yeah. So I played for Grasshoppers, did well, two years. But I felt that the Swiss League was not to my level. In my, in my opinion, I wanted to, do, to, to play at a higher level. I didn't have the opportunity because I had no caps. I was, of course, blacklisted from the TTFA at the time, not allowed to play to come home. And so because of that, I went to Belgium, which at the time was the fourth best league in Europe, um, with Anderlecht and Mechelen, the big clubs at that time, you know, winning the European Cup and stuff. And I played for Watergum two years, and the best two years of football I had. Mm -hmm. I was in my prime, you know, that was from the age of 26 to 28, physically and everything. And really getting to know the game, understanding the game after Utman Hitzfeld. And, and in Belgium, I had René Verheyen, uh, was a Belgian international, also a very good coach. So my football really took off in Belgium. And that's why I got a good offer to go to Greece, um, went there. Um, of course, Greece administratively was chaos, pretty much like here, and uh, went back from there to Greece to Grasshoppers, and then that's when Ben Hacker was the coach, and had great, year, great years with Grasshoppers, uh, two years with them before I went to, to, to the Middle East. Mm -hmm. I, let us, let's bring it home in terms of, of your, your, national, your national football, um, and I remember, would it, would it have been in the late 80s when you probably could have represented the, the then strike squad. Um, I, I, I was a young football fan then, and I, and I remember your name coming up, and I would say, uh, I, 
how, how, how would he fit into this team now? And that was me and my young. I was I was a coach on right. the on, on the chair. Right. So see, I said, oh, 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 David Nakit, we're not fitting with, with Russell Atopi and Kerry James in the midfield. You know? <laughs> but, but I remember back then your name would have surfaced and explain to the young football, the, the football fans know what, what would have happened back then that would have affected your your national team appearances. Well, we must always put things in context. Um, I was invited back in Trinidad to play for that team because of a coach called John Kerr, who had played with Gali Cummins right. in, the, I think, New York Cosmos or something. And um, he had sent a letter, without me knowing, mm -hmm. to Gali and, to, and because they were friends. Well, colleagues, he said, not really friends, but they were colleagues, and he told him that David Nakid, I feel he's at the level, he's in Europe now. So I got a, a letter from Jack Warner, who, of course, is true FIFA, um, that I should come for the national team. So, of course, of course, anybody would love to come and play for the national team. So I came home. Um, things didn't go well, which is normal. I've never complained about that. A coach could like a player or not like a player. That's his choice. He will live or he will die by that choice. Um, so when I went back, there was a big hullabaloo for whatever reason that, uh, you know, I, I think Ali was, one, a bit put off by the fact that I was a professional in Europe. He never played in Europe. Uh, Gali is about Gali. And he felt that he, had, he, had, he, known, he knew everything about football because he was basically given that leeway here in China and Tobago. We didn't, we didn't have journalists who would question or pose the right questions. Yeah, we had a few. We had Keith Shepard, Sherry Andillion, people, Jamal Shabazz at the time. But we didn't have journalists like we have now, like yourself, like Lasana, like Bird, like people who would really put questions to them. So he, he did what he did, which I, as I, I never complained about. I left. But what they did is try to paint a picture of my character, because I'm outspoken that I had tried to you know, inveigle the team in certain ways and all that, which is complete crap. Um, I, I knew I was better than the rest of the players. I was playing in Europe, not because of that. Russell was still quite young. Mm -hmm. And I was, at that time, already a midfield. I could control a, a, a team. And all of those players that we saw in that United States team, I had played against them in college, Inclu including Paul Calgary, the guy who scored the goal, had played against me in the championship, college championships for UCLA, and I was playing for American University. I completely dominated that guy. And he scored. So those guys still ask me, who and who I who are friends with me on that US team, Bruce Murray and they, when they see me, they, they laugh. Yeah. You know, you know, you know, you couldn't make that as I yeah. <laughs> which is okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. You live or you die by your decisions. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But when they try to paint my character a certain way, they had a problem with me. And I think Jack Warner came to that realization after because I basically, when I left, I said I would never play for China again because they made my mother cry. And for me, that's a red line. So I never came back. I had been asked sometimes before I was in 92 in a one-off game. And I didn't come back until my mother got my father to call me. And in our family, our cult is, uh, you know, when your father call and tell you to do something, you do it, no matter your age. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Daddy, um, that, daddy, daddy call it. When daddy call it. Yeah, when Mr. Rackett call it. Yeah, 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 it's serious. You, you, you do. You do it. So I came back and played one game in Jamaica. Right. They had lost the first game here. Yeah. 2 1 against that Jamaica. That was 92. 92. Yeah. And they had to win the game. So said the Joseph and Alvin Henderson, and they convinced Jack. And he said, okay, you can bring him out. I have nothing to do with it. So I came back and played and did a great game in Jamaica. Clovis Oliver, I think, was the coach at the time. He told Jack, listen, oh, they're mad. Naked, he's the best player, heads and shoulders, something to that effect. But Jack was having none of it because Jack was done with Gali, you know, which he later on regretted. So um, long story short, I continued my career in, in, in Europe. And after one tour we made, Grasshoppers, we went to Brazil and played against Flamengo, Fluminense, and I was outstanding. I mean, I was outstanding. Um, junior, if you remember Junior from Brazil, he was a coach of Flamengo. And they had asked him, we played against him, we won 2-0. I set up Giovanni Elba for the first goal, scored the second. And he, you know, he made comments, they asked him, you know, this first team to beat Flamengo in Brazil in 25 years. 
in Euro in 25 years was us, Grasshopper Zurich. And he said, they have a player, David Nackett, he could play for Brazil. He could play for Brazil. When that got back to Jack, was as all over in East West, Jack was rising in FIFA at the time. Jack contacted me to come home and play. Because at that time, and Jack was saying to himself, I think he even wrote about it. He was getting out talking FIFA. He said, oh, they are knackered here, making all kind of team in Europe, playing in Champions League and in the European Cup at the time. And he came over to Ireland and they go, Jack eventually contacted me in 1994, met me in a hotel in Zurich, of the Bahnhof Chasse. I never forget that. He was quite inebriated, you know, you know, could to get his strength up. You know, he wouldn't mind me saying that. And um, he told me, he said, listen, I make a big, I make a big mistake. I would like you to come and play for China. He said that. He quote, unquote? Quote, uh, verbatim. Mm -hmm. We spoke for about an hour. I told him, no. I met you because it was a favor to Walter Gack. Walter Gack, who had brought me to, to Europe, had asked me to speak with Jack, um, you know, as a favor to him. And um, I did. I told him no. Jack, of course, spoke with family and, and Dr. Henderson. Not Alvin, his father, who was very close to my mom and dad. Again, they got Mr. Naki to call me. <laughs> and I came back. Right. That was it. I won the MVP in that tournament. So, yes, so it really is really Mr. Naki, your father, yeah, that yeah, was I mean, responsible I, yes. for you coming back to play with Hundred percent. Hundred percent. Of course, my mother was behind it because right. he didn't also didn't want me to come back. Right, right. Because he had seen his, so, his so wife. So it's, it's, it's mom. His mom. It's mom. It's mom. Mom pulling the strings behind the scenes. 100%. Right. 100%. Mm -hmm. Got you. Mm -hmm. And he, when he, uh, I came back in 94, of course, that tournament, I played with Ansel and those guys. Great team. We beat Martinique 7-2 in the final or something. Um, and that was, a, that was a powerful team. Yeah. Not only in terms of skill level and all that. That's a powerful team in terms of character. Yeah. We had a, a serious... Togetherness. Yeah, Tiganini's character as a team, you know what I mean? I didn't like everybody on the team, and I'm sure everybody didn't like me. Because I'm a, I was a very demanding player. Very, very demanding of the players, and, and you know, and especially on the field. Off the field, I'll nine and kicks for them, you know, but on the field, they, they better bring the A game. You know, and, and they did, to be fair to them. You know, all those players, Dexter Francis, Dwork, uh, Nixon, Cocky, everybody bought a game and we put some licks on people yeah, for the next yeah. three It was a good little euro. It was a good little yeah, 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 I think yeah. we won the Caribbean Cup back to back, back to three back. times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Bertel Sinclair rose as a coach back then and I think he would have been kind of responsible for yes, he was. having you as, as, as the captain of the team at that time. Correct, in 96. Um, tell me about his, his impact on you as a coach. Well, I knew Bertel from the national youth team. Right. Um, he was the coach, and um, we, we developed, Bertil and I, never, we, didn't, we didn't see eye to eye. No. But the difference between Bertil and the rest of everybody is that Bertil will value, give you your value on the field. You see, we have people there who take things, they take personal. things personally, you know? So Bertil, I was outspoken, and Bertil and I, too much. since from the youth team, I remember Bertil and I in Guatemala had a serious falling out, but he didn't drop me. We had a fallen out because he asked an opinion, and I give him my opinion. He asked, should he have played? We played against Canada. Just make it so you understand why Bertil head and shoulders above everybody. And that's why it's not about personality. It has to be about what value you bring. You know, we played against Honduras first game. Honduras was by far the favorites. By far. We drew them 2-2. I had an outstanding game. So second game we played against Canada, all we needed to do was draw or went to go through. Gard Polonia was the star back then and the forward. He was injured, so we had a choice to make. Should we play a guy called Fitzroy? Um, had, I think we used to call him Hardweather from Tobago. Big, strong guy. Or Roger Gibbs against Canada. Both they went with Hardweather. In my opinion, we should have gone with Roger Gibbs because Roger Gibbs was the best dribbler in China and Tobago at the time. Against the tall Canadians, I thought he would be more effective. And I was only 17 years old, and that was my thinking. We played with Harvard, he was very ineffective. Canada, long story short, Canada beat us 2 0. And after the game, he asked me, and I told him a lie. My suggestion was, and big fight, third game, 
Everybody think I'll be dropped. No, but there's plenty. But uh, that's why I respect for somebody like that. Because here in Trinidad, something, another coach here in Trinidad, you know, he ain't seen no. the field. Not going to get blacklisted. Yeah, yeah, yeah you know. <laughs> <laughs> but but it was about yeah. the value that you could bring yeah. to the team. And that's why our relationship stayed prop, uh, in, in a good way. Yeah. And uh, he made, I was made captain in 96. I was MVP. Not only MVP, but I was national player of the year mm -hmm. in that year. Um, and I said that TTFA who hated my guts, you yeah. know, I mean, Oliver Camps and all of them, good and them. I mean, they, they couldn't stand the side of me. Yeah, yeah. Because one, I'd make sure that those guys were being paid. Yeah. You know, I mean, that's one thing Angus Eve, is he will clearly say, when I was there, they got paid. Because I'm not playing, I'm not going and play on any pitch or any field unless my players get paid. You know? That was an issue in 2000 when we when we were doing well in the Gold Cup. Remember that? Yeah, that that became that, a that, that Cup, became that a Gold Cup team. That became an issue because that team was should have really been the first team to go to, the final. to not only the final but to the World Cup. Right. To make a World Cup, that was by far the more, most balanced team. Everybody was had was at the right age and with the right experience. We had everybody was playing in a big team. Everybody was playing in a big team. I was playing in a big team in, at that time in Emirates. Um, every, Cocky and Stone John was in MLS. And do, not only in MLS, people don't know, but they, they, were, they were exceptional players in MLS. Latters, I think, was in Porto. I was still in, I'll come back to Scotland. You know, Dwight was doing his thing in Man. I mean, Shaka was in West. We had a really, really good team. And that team would have gone to the World Cup and I and I repeat that with some some measure of, some measure of ease. But um, as usual, administrators unable to go past their ego. Jack felt that there was too much attention on on the team, so he began to put our side. How much money he was paying? Naked, how much money he was paying? Letters and the papers, and we can understand why. And of course, when we realized that the team was making a certain amount of money every time we progressed, we began to ask, well, why the team is not benefiting from that money? Why the TTFA alone should benefit from that money? And um, they didn't like the questions. So they, are, they placed some very, some onerous, unbelievable condition on Brutal having to reach the final, to win the Gold Cup. Imagine that. We had never gone out of our group stage yeah, yeah, yeah. in our history. I, think I remember, I remember covering it. <laughs> right, exactly. We had never even gone out of the group stage. Yeah, yeah. All of a sudden, now, yeah, Bertel yeah. was tasked with winning the Gold Cup. Yeah, I remember. With, uh, listen to this: Who in the Gold Cup? Brazil, yeah. Mexico, Costa Rica. Yeah. Well, we got past Costa Rica. Yeah, we the did quarter the quarterfinal, yeah, yeah. and um, we reached Canada, who we dominated. Yeah. I missed, of course, the penalty that could have taken us through, but we completely dominated Canada. I mean, I, when we look back and we hear the commentary of the game and the, the guy, the commentator saying that this is by far the best Trinidad and Tobago team he's ever seen in terms of possession and how we played, how we approached the game. Players, our play, we had players who could play out to the back, midfielders who could hold the ball, forwards who could score. Um, and Dwight didn't play in that game for some mysterious reason, um, which we know, right. you know what I mean? Um, they really didn't want Dwight to play. But having said that, I think that would have been didn't the team. want to play? Um, the TTFA. Didn't want to no, play? No, no, the TTFA really didn't want us to go through. I mean, uh, I, I remember Enrique Sanz. I will say these things clear because I've said it. It's on record. Enrique Sanz at that time was in CONCACAF, who became NATO General Secretary. He became close with us. I mean, with us, I mean, Brutal Richard Braffitt. Um, and he was like liaison. I remember him telling us, we had to beat Guatemala to go through. We beat them 4-2. I scored, Dorica scored, Lata scored, Dwight scored. People were saying four best players on the team scored. So we had some bargaining power. That's why, that's why I mentioned that to you. Enrique Sanz told us that in the boot, you know, the, the sky boot in, uh, over, it was we were playing in Los Angeles, I think the LA Coliseum, I think. Um, he said they were watching the game, and I will call their names, Gordon, Oliver Camps, some of that clung, I think Ferguson, one of them. They were there with Jack, of course, and uh, uh, no, that's a different one. <laughs> <laughs> Com completely different one. <laughs> uh, 
completely different one. This one was the one, the one who was always with Tarong. I can't remember the name. I can't right? forget, forget yeah, the name. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And they, um, <laughs> and they, and the case hands told us, they were watching, he was watching the game with them. And every time Guatemala scored, because it was a close game until we pulled away from them from about the 60th minute, 65th minute. When Guatemala scored, they were cheering. And when we scored, they were cursing. Yeah. He told us that, and that's why he came and he said, he couldn't understand yeah, why. You see I'm very serious. He told us, that's why I call his name so easily, because he said that to me, he said that to Bertil, and I, I Bertil and they were there. I never forgot the look on Bertil's face, his hurt. Because Bertil is a decent man. He was generally hurt. But I know in football and these people, I was not. What they did, I came back and told the players. And that is where we, come, we came and we beat Costa Rica. Costa Rica was uh, one of the top teams in, at the time. And we, we beat them. We played well. We played good football. That was what was important. And then against Canada, we completely dominated and shut and up. David, did you enjoy playing football for Toronto Tobago? I enjoyed it more than playing professionally. I'll be honest with you. I enjoyed it more. You know why? When you've been denied something for so long, I mean, I played with the national youth team, and then after that, I, w I did not play for China until I was 29, 30 years old. I, I, w I played seven, eight years in Europe at the highest level and couldn't play. I remember playing for Grasshoppers my last year with Giovanni Elba. Of course, he was owned by AC Milan. So they used to come to see him play. They would send scouts, they would send. And we were playing against, again, 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 FC Lugano, Grasshoppers, in Lugano, which is on the border between Milan, Switzerland, and Italy. And they sent quite a few scouts to see him. You know, AC Milan. He couldn't make the team at that time because AC Milan had Boban and, and Savicevic. And, you know, but he was, Giovanni was like 19 years old. And he had just won the most goals in the FIFA Youth World Cup. So that's why they bought him. So they came to see Giovanni played. An outstanding game. We beat Lugano 4-1. I set up three of the goals for Giovanni. Set up three, but you know I could pass the ball, and I could, you know, and step it through for him, and you know he finished. And they came and spoke to me after the game. You see Milan, not about coming to Milan because you know they have feeder teams all over, but they they came to speak to me about Ancona. Ancona at the time had Casagrande from Brazil, the player, one with the long hair. They spoke to me seriously. But when they found out I had zero caps, or one cap, the cap from 92, I had no chance. So what they did to my career with, with, the, with the foolishness, you know, I, somebody would have held it and say I'm not coming because it's grass. Suppose in 94, when Jack, although Walter Jackson had set up the meeting, grass suppose had a contract with me to renew for another two years at the age of 29 or two, going on 30. If also I would not play for Trinidad anymore, to the back and forth now, if I would not go and play for Trinidad. And I refused. And that's why I went to the Middle East. So uh, I'll tell you, I, I don't think I've ever told you that in the times where we would have, have interacted. But um, as I said, and as before I talked, before I was a, a journalist, um, as a football fan, a young football fan, when I saw you for the first time represent the country, because I said back in the late 80s, I, I never saw you play. Correct. I would have um, been outside. So, yes, yeah, so I was saying, but, you know, who's this one coming to try to make my strike score? You know, yeah, that kind of thing. But I in trouble. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was my, my, my initial reaction yeah. as, a, as, as, a, as a football fan. And I all remember the first time I saw you play, it was a, 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 in the early 90s there when you, when you got onto the team. Mama Ujo, I said, say, so we were denied as football fans trying to let go this fellow playing in our team. For so many years, that was my that was my email. I mean, I was just a football fan. Nobody didn't care what I said at that point in time. But I remember feeling that way when I saw you play, and I started to see the contribution that you could make to a national team in Trinidad and Tobago. And as I said, what it, what what is it, it is it is it, it, it is what it is, so to speak. That you can't you can't, you can't repeat. It happened now. It happened. It happened that way. Um, but we have David Nakit here, and you see what I tell you. He, he says it as it is. We're going to talk a little bit of politics, a little bit of FIFA presidency. And then we're going to get to the matter at hand uh, where we speak uh, to what's happening here and, and get David Nackett's take on what's happening here in Trinidad and Tobago in terms of football at this point in time. We're coming back. This is the Ascension Football Show. Pest control is a pain, but you don't have to go it alone. 
If you're a business that needs someone who will fix your problems point blank, go with the brand that's tested. Go with Terminix. Born almost a century ago in Memphis, Tennessee, Terminix International's mission has been to spread its innovations across the world through its integrated pest and termite management system, reducing the infestation of pests and vermin. Our Trinidad franchise neutralizes the threat of tropical insects and ensures that companies, from food production to hospitality, protect their investment and get the maximum value from our relationship. And we've been doing it well for over 20 years. Termites and pests are relentless, but they're no match for Terminix. Contact us today for a free consultation and quote, and let's introduce you to convenience. Protect your premises today. Choose a service provider that persists. Talk to Terminix. Pests bothering you? Call Terminix at 672-5007 or 672-0042 or visit our website at terminix.co.tt for a free quote and consultation. Join our fight against pests. Get in the game with Ascension. Ascension. Quality for champions. Yeah. Ascension, Ascension, premium quality and style make you stand out all the time. Ascension is quality for champions. Ascension fit is always right, take your game to higher heights. Ascension got the quality for champions. Now everybody say, hey, oh. we wearing Ascension when we play. Ascension, quality for champions. Lasso Frame Maritime Limited, the best in marina services. At our facilities, security checks ensures that all vehicles are secured. Our newly renovated bathrooms are always kept in a clean working order. Need repairs and maintenance? We have you covered. Our qualified workmen will get the job done. Boat storages. From our marina, you can easily push off for a family sailing trip. Fishing with the boys. Or a fun DDI experience with friends. Repairs, secured parking, extensive camera system, port charters, port rentals, down the island parties. Contact us at 1 634 1653. Lasso Frame Maritime Limited, the best in marina services. Life's better on a boat.
more. Number 271 Southern Main Road, Macbean, Cuba. Amanzi Del Cafe. Happiness begins with brew. All right, guys, we're back. David Nakid here with us, uh, taking us down memory lane. And David, as a, as a, after his playing days, continued in his colorful ways and made a run in 2015, it was, for the FIFA president. I remember when seeing the story coming to my desk. I said, I said David, mad. <laughs> that was my reaction, David. I, I, said, I said, why, how, when? David Nackett feels he can make a run for FIFA president. What, 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 what led to that decision? Well, your reaction wouldn't be singular to you. Eh? Yeah. I mean, that was a reaction at the beginning with everyone because FIFA and CONCACAF, they're, they're very much like colonial masters. They set things up that we who really own this thing never believe that it be, can belong to us, that we can have a serious be a serious part of it. So that's why your action was, was how it is. Um, and I prove that that is not so. Because we did get five, the five votes, and that's something that people like Figo, Luis Figo, Zico, can get from their own country, from their own confederation. And so we, we got it. But of course, the United States um, were very wary of me becoming of being in that race for FIFA presidency, because I, I, I got a lot of traction throughout the Caribbean. When I actually met with the, 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 the MAs throughout the Caribbean, I caused some ruction. I knew that after when I heard what happened, you know, after you will hear the whole story is coming out. I mean, the United, the, the United States Soccer Federation was calling people back and forth to try and scuttle my bid, and I had them united for a while. I really had them united, because I let them see that once they have somebody on the table, they will have more food to get. And not the scraps that we are normally accustomed to. We get now. Where is Caribbean football now? When I speak with some of them, I ask them, where is Caribbean football now? You happy with the state of Caribbean football? It's a, you know, we have to look at, so within that context, I felt at the time, not only for Carib the Caribbean, but for all third world countries, Africa, Asia, I felt that we needed someone who understood football from the ground going up. You see everything in FIFA is from up coming down. And I felt we needed somebody who could rep really represent the ground and bring it up to where it's supposed to. So at least we meet somewhere in the middle. And that was basically the philosophy, economic and technical, that I had in place. And that's why my manifesto actually was well received when I, I, I did a debate in Europe against Champagne who was also one of the, the candidates. And um, I did a, a debate against him and, and beat him in, in Denmark in a debate there. And my manifesto, my philosophy for how we can correct the inequities in global football um, could be done. It was well received, but of course my... Could you give me a little nutshell version of what happened? Because, I mean, the reports came out in terms of aborting your run. Um, give me a nutshell version of, of, of well, what I happened. Well, I had... Um, I, got, I, I was invited by Gordon Derrick, who at the time was the president of CFU, or the secretary, I forgot, but he invited me to speak to them. And they had a meeting, a general meeting. I went. At that time, I was traveling through the Caribbean, and I spoke with them. You know, people, as Jamal would say, Shabazz, people were sleeping, nodding off. They, they just, just like my child with grasshoppers. They gave me 15 minutes at the end to speak to them. People nodding off because they were there all day. But when I spoke to them, everybody wake up. I let them know that something needs to be done. And um, they threw their way. They, threw their, they gave me CFU's unanimous support. And from there, we moved on. And we had the five votes secured. And of course, the USSF spoke with that house Negro in, in the United States, Virgin Islands. Um, I forget his name. And he double nominated, which he had to know was not something he could do. Could have done that purposefully? But, uh, yeah, he did approve. Of course, purpose. Yeah, of course, because he had nominated me before, and then somebody else. He just said he will nominate them, and that scuttles your bid. And FIFA knew about it, and they called me on the last hour. I remember they called me. I was in Denmark. They called me at quarter to twelve. Quarter to twelve. I was in Denmark. I had, we had just finished the debate, 
in Denmark to let me know that there's something wrong with the nomination. Because I'd already sent in all the votes and everything. And it was, I was getting traction. People had, I was invited to speak to, at the time, three African MAs had invited me to come and meet with them at their, at their expense. So it was getting some traction because you had a, a man who represents, for me, the most global country in the world. I always say Trinidad and Tobago, people are, we are the most global country. We have everything here. We have everything here and with some measure, some degree of harmony, you know? And um, I think people saw that and I, I think we would have done well, but you know, House Negroes uh, uh, have always been a problem in the advancement of, of, of black people. And when I say black people, I mean all what we consider black people, of course, you are African Indians, Asians, that people, our people, always our efforts to advance, scuttled by house Negroes. You decided to jump into the political ring in Trent Tobago. Um, what prompted that decision? Huh. I was invited. You know, I have an academy yes. in, in Lebanon. In, and in Lebanon. Between yeah. Lebanon and Belgium. Still have it, still have it going yeah, on. Yeah, it's still going on. And we have been quite successful in my academy. We sold players to Europe, and, and we, we've done extremely well. Um, we had players from here come up in the, and from the elite under-15 team and play with us in a tournament in Madrid, which we won. So we were, my academy has gotten some international acclaim, thank God. I was invited by Grenada. Look at that. The Grenadian Football Association invited me to be their global football ambassador, Cheney Joseph. And... Um, of course, they asked me to come out. I went there. I met with, their, with all their stakeholders. I conducted some sessions, coaching sessions and, and stuff. I had, did an evaluation of their coaches. And um, while I was there, they asked me to stay longer. But there was a break or something in between because somebody was coming, a coach they wanted for the youth development was coming. They wanted me to evaluate him and see him. I said, okay, well, I'll go to Trinidad because I hadn't been home for a while. I go to Trinidad, came to Trinidad, locked down. Came to Trinidad, locked down, and I began to see the need, because I was staying, of course, in the East in St. Joseph, and I saw the need. So my family has always given hampers. My mom and dad always worked in charitable charities, and, and I began to do the same. I began to give out hampers along in St. Joseph, Mongdo, all along that I, in Bangladesh, what we call Bangladesh there. Serious hampers. I, I said, well, we do have a government. I serious. I asked you, we do have a government? In times like this, I mean, they could say and stunt and front and say what they want. I, I not, there's not politics here. I talked on this before I got into politics. I was asking, well, we do have a, I remember, I had, one day, I, I collected 300 hampers. And this was the second day I was going up Mongdo Hill. Because you know, lower Mongdo, okay, is people middle class, and when you go up Mongdo, Spring Valley, and serious poverty. I remember when they heard Nakit coming back second day. I never forget this. I see old people running down Mongdo Hill, tripping over each other for hampers. I said, nah. No, this can't be Trinidad and Tobago. That level of poverty I had seen only in the refugee camps in the Middle East. Because I had done some work, and as a matter of fact, in 2016, I was given a contract, my academy, with the German government and the Cultural Institute of Germany, Goethe, it's called Goethe, Goethe Cultural Institute, to put on a, a six-week camps for Syrian refugees. And it was a big budget thing. You had to buy everything for them. And, you know, so it was like an 800,000 euro budget we had. That level of poverty is what I saw. People, old people running down Mongo Hill to get a hamper, tripping over each other. I said, no, no. And that, I took my decision there. Of course, you had Julian John who was monitoring what I was doing and you know, they contacted me. Well, I was contacted by all the parties. No matter what they could say, all the them could say what they want. All of them contact me, you know, with a view so that I could join. And I met with all of them. But when I, I listened and I saw, I had, I had to account to myself, who have us in this state? 
who has been in charge the most? I can come and tax you, Joel Balafane, if you run in the TTFA for a year, and come and blame you for the ills of TTFA for 100 years, and somebody was there for six years, that is just common sense. And with, based on that, I made my decision, and I uh, decided to go with the, with the UNC. In this for the long haul? Everything I do, I do it until it's completed. I'm not saying I will reach my desired goal. I was able to do so in Europe, in football. I was able to do so in other endeavors with my academy and so. I don't know, politics is a very, very strange game. David Nakir, are you ready to talk football politics? Are you ready to talk anything? <laughs> when we come back, the state of football here in Trent Tobago, what is Mr. Haddad doing? The situation we have here is that these characters, and I refer to them as pests, right? What they are doing is destroying our country, but not on my watch. No street, no turf, no block shall belong to these cockroaches, right? It's no longer business as usual. Happy hour is over. If they don't fear God, at least they will fear Terminix. Have you considered how your methods could impact on pests across the country? I find we look after the rights of pests as opposed to the rights of the 1.3 million law-abiding citizens in Trinidad and Tobago. I wonder if Roach Ladenstone come here for the carnival if, if you'll interview me. But how can you defend one shot, one kill? What? You want me to throw a pillow at him? I didn't say that. No, well, if a roach jumps in front of you now, what would you do? Run. Oh, Jesus, Lord, Father. <laughs> Pests bothering you? Call Terminix at 672-5007 or 672-0042 or visit our website at terminix.co.tt for a free quote and consultation. Join our fight against pests. Get in the game with Ascension. What for champions? Ascension! Located at Magnificent Mall, number 271, Southern Main Road, Macbean, Cuba. Amanze Del Cafe. Happiness begins with brew. Lasso Frame Maritime Limited, the best in marina services. Our facilities, security checks ensures that all vehicles are secured. Our newly renovated bathrooms are always kept in a clean working order. 
Need repairs and maintenance? We have you covered. Our qualified workmen will get the job done. Boat storages. From our marina, you can easily push off for a family sailing trip. Fishing with the boys. Or a fun DDI experience with friends. Repairs, secured parking, extensive camera system, port charters, port rentals, down the island parties. Contact us at 1-868-634-1653. Lasso Frame Maritime Limited. The best in marina services. Lives better on a boat. So a few weeks ago, the stakeholders of the Trans Tobago Football Federation signed by a number of the stakeholders, I would say the majority of the stakeholders in Trans Tobago's football uh, would have stated very clearly their discontent with the current normalization committee um, in terms of how they're running things, lack of communication, what's going on, and so on. Mr. Haddad responded almost immediately. Mr. Haddad is the chairman of this normalization committee, for those of you who don't know. And he responded almost immediately, assuring the stakeholders that he'll be in touch he understands their concerns i was impressed that you know a hey, immediate response it then took another approximately two weeks before that response would have come it came and uh, whether or not the stakeholders are happy or not is another question altogether but one of the things in terms of dealing with the issues that are at before us now, whether or not Mr. Haddad and his normalization committee would deal with it point by point in detail is what I think is one of the major issues in trying to make football because we are in a state where we need proper direction. We need a solid plan as to how we will get out of the situation that we are in. David Nackett is here, and uh, I just want to give that little background as to what happened over the last couple of weeks um, leading into this discussion, David. Um, before, before we jump into the normalization committee, let me just take you back quickly um, in terms of what you would have known in terms of happened over this period of time leading up to the normalization committee being appointed by FIFA and Mr. Haddad kind of taking okay. control. Uh, the, the state of football, when you looked at it from... Let's just go to the David John Williams administration into what led almost to an explosion by FIFA. Um, what, 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 what was your thoughts on, on that little period there? Well, you know, everybody goes in into position of leadership probably with good intentions. The problem with finding the right leader is, and that's what we've had in Trinidad and Tobago, at all levels, politics, uh, sporting, uh, social, is that do they have the qualities for that position of leadership? And David John Williams, who I would consider a friend, I never felt that he had those qualities to be a leader of a football federation. Not because he doesn't have good qualities. He does. He does. He's an, you know, he, he, and in the end, and I've always said this, this is on record, he built a, the home of football that we hadn't had, we hadn't built in, in years with a FIFA vice president. Let's not forget that. But that's the end of it. Because on the other side, 
he basically attended to nothing. You know, a lot of programs were left unattended to in terms of youth development. They were, I understand, uh, certain, certain allegations of corruption. And, and, you know what I mean? So in terms of that value for the leadership position, I didn't think he, he had it. Plus, when you become a leader, it cannot be about you. You know, it, 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 it stops being about you then. You really have to take care of the people around you, your stakeholders, because they are the ones who have elected you leader and put you there. And if you're unable to do that, then you, you're, you're not a leader. You're, you're leading yourself. So I think in terms of DJW, that, that, that has been a problem. Um, but it, it's not inimical to him. I mean, that has been widespread when you look at our leadership. I, I mentioned before, we have, we've had autocratic leaders. We have one like, like Jack Warner. And going down, going down the line to, to a mix of the two to, to complete incompetence. And, um, uh, and that is unfortunate because uh, I think we missed a few generations of, of footballers and sportsmen in Trinidad and Tobago because of it. Mm -hmm. when, 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 you, when the politics got almost nasty um, and, and, and we were actually facing uh, expulsion from, 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 from FIFA, were you, where, 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 where was your head at that point in time? When we when we you reckon, hey, we could actually lose our membership here. Um, well, I I think that that should be the, the the photo, really the 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 build we say the the picture of what I spoke about, because Wallace and um, Leclerc promised a lot and delivered. Few of them, you know, what I mean? they went completely against what they were promising. I, I've seen some of the the, the, the reports and, and what they promised. I've seen, and I, I don't blame this on Lecloy. Eh? Uh, Lecloy, for all his autocratic tendencies and, and ego, which is quite large, I think um, I think Wallace has to be. You know, we, we tend to give him a pass, Wallace, but he's the one to blame. He's the one who went and gave Fenwick that contract without the board knowing and he, without even Lecloy knowing. Uh, apparently, so I, I think I think Wallace completely failed. That doesn't give FIFA the right to do what they did. It didn't. It did not give FIFA the right to do what they did at all. Uh, I think FIFA that was pre-planned. I, I mean, I was saying about FIFA coming in here the day that John Williams lost the election. I began to hear that from my contacts out, outside that FIFA was trying to come in and just waiting, biding their time, and that can't be good. Having said that, I, I think that Lukler and they came in and immediately, immediately, I didn't like the autocrat, autocratic tendencies that they, they, were, they were employing, that they spoke about John Williams as well. And that's the problem we have in China. I don't know what it is about that chair, Joel. I don't know what it is about that chair, that when people get into it, it's just a free for all. They forget, they, they forget their, their sense of, of morality. They, 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 principle, the core principles that they preach. And it's not that difficult. And I'm not saying somebody has to be a saint in that position. Not at all. But you have to maintain a certain amount of, of dignity in that office for yourself. You know? And it brings me to this, 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 this new clung that we have here, um, Haddad. Be before you get to that, David, yeah. let me just clarify. You, you would not have been in our agreement with FIFA appointing a normalization committee at the time? No, no, no. I, despite what Wallace and they were not heading on the right path, yeah. I think uh, there was no precedent for, for how, they, I mean, it, it was a democratically elected. It, it, the, the, the votes, everything was democratically done. That debt was there before, yeah. when John Williams was there. They knew about it. Yeah. They worked with him. So there's no excuse for them bringing in a normalization committee who was there a few months, who they did not one time fund. They, they withheld funding. And they were trying. So that's what forced them to do the crazy things they did with the, with the sponsorship deal that they said they had with AVEC, and, because there's no funding coming in. So I'm not excusing them. They also behaved like idiots, Wallace, and, you know, and they, they, they were not completely clear with their, with their stakeholders. What FIFA did? No, I could never agree with that. 
if we talk in the truth and we've been honest, no, what they did was completely in the self-serving because you know if that investigation into Williams went in, they knew that Veron, Musang, the fellow who they had here coming back and forth, the, 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 the house Negro for Infantino, Veron is his name, I think. They, they knew there was something, something wrong with, with his dealings with Trinidad and Tobago. They knew that. Let, let me just play devil's advocate here. Um, the, the reality, even, even to this letter, the latest letter that Mr. Haddad would have sent to, 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 to the, uh, I mean, we're hoping it's Mr. Haddad because the letter wasn't signed by him. So we, I'm, I'm not wow. sure. Yeah, it wasn't. Yeah, I have the letter here. and It, it wasn't signed by him. So we, we, it's on a Trinidad Tobago Football Federation um, letterhead but not signed by Mr. Haddad. I'm just verifying, no. Um, if, if it is, he's, he, the very first matter of dealing with the financial status of the TTFA, it's a figure of 98, based on, I think, audited, audited finances, based on, 98 I think, million. 90, <laughs> you see, those figures can't come out of my mouth without stuttering, because I, 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 I think at one point I was in 50, 60 million, it has reached close to a hundred million dollars that the TTFA is in debt by. That, that's based on all the accounts that Mr. Haddad is presenting. Right. FIFA, as the, the organizing body responsible for its associates, Trinidad Tobago being one, wouldn't say, listen, I know this debt has been rising for some time, but it's a, it has no reached proportions of that I think I need to get involved. I need to put a normalization and committee in place to at least see where we're going from here. Is that not a damn just reasonable? Any, any, any director, any CEO would say, listen, I don't think Mr. Nack can manage this thing properly. Let me, let me, let me get Mr. John to, to handle it. OK, well, then why not do it before? Mm -hmm. Timing. The timing. Why not do it before? If you're talking about being transparent and honest and you're credible as an institution like FIFA is, you could have done it before, if that is the logic that you have now employed. Yes, I agree 100%. But before, now you've brought somebody in who has said that you have to give them a chance. Now, they were not going in the right direction. I agree with you. Now, you've seen things in, in hindsight. But we didn't know that. We didn't know that about the deal and the convoluted deal with different people. We did not know about it. So I don't think FIFA were completely transparent and credible, can be credible in what they did. Having said that, however, they, 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 Wallace and Leclerc and they did not acquit themselves well in the, the small time that, that they had. Um, but the problem is, what do we do now? Right. So let, let's come to that. I mean, you know, the, the realization that we, the reality is that we have a, a normalization committee in place, right. running the sport, um, and, and Mr. Haddad is at the helm of that. Um, what do we do now? How, right. how, 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 how do we? How do we want to deal with the financial status of the TTFA that has built itself up over three, four decades? How, do, right, how, let, do, how do we do that? Let, let's, let's assume that the primary focus of the NC, the Normalization Committee, um, is to organize the financial affairs of the TTFA. It, it has to be one of the primary responsibilities. It must be. It must be. Yeah. It must be. Mm -hmm. Because we, it, it lays on the premise that you, you said before, that we don't like the debt, it's ballooning, it's out of control. We have to send someone in. That was their premise, correct? Okay. We assume so. We, we, assume, assume, we so. assume so. We assume so. He's been there almost a year. Yeah, so. He says operationalize in six months because I read his letter. So he's trying to say, give himself a little leave. Okay, we'll give him that leeway for that five, six months. So he's been there operati operationalized six months. That's what he's saying, right? Stakeholders might disagree. What has he done? in that six months. Six months is a long time, at least for finances. OK, he said he made an audit. I laugh in his letter when he said he made that audit, he said. Um, not a lot of details. You're talking to your stakeholders. He talked about something, a plan that is, a, you, listen, who are you talking to? This is not your company. This is not hardcore. This does not belong to you. You have to be as detailed as you can be when you speak to your stakeholders. That is how someone operates an association. You can't say, I have a plan in place, and I will do that. And um, uh, some other uh, specious things he said. 
Be another word he's telling you all, I am the boss. The same autocratic tendency. That, that's what he got from his letter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I am yeah. the boss. And I will give you a little, yeah. a little scrap. Hold that. You don't, you don't need details. You do not need details. Right. In other words, who are you all to ask me anything about this? You know why? FIFA appoint me. Yeah. Can, can I ask you, I mean, based on your, your, your information and, and, and your, your, your knowledge, right now, who is Mr. Haddad responsible to? Well, Mr. Haddad seems to think that he's responsible. No, I'm not asking who, 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 who he thinks he's responsible. Who should be responsible. Who should be responsible to at this point. Is it FIFA or is it the man? FIFA? No, 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 no. FIFA appointed no, 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 him? No, no, no. FIFA appointed him? FIFA could appoint him, but he's not responsible to FIFA. Yes. He has to report to FIFA. Right. He's responsible to the stakeholders of Trinidad and Tobago. Yes. That's, That's who he should be responsible mm -hmm. to. But as usual, I don't know, you know, Bertel Sinclair used to say, you know, we are people, we free white people. You know what I mean? Uh, we fail white people. We don't, we don't ask. You know, we give everybody a blight. So Fenwick could bust a boat on a man. And everybody, you know, yeah, let that pass. You know what I mean? Let that pass. But then knock it or you will have a bust a boat on somebody now. And see where that reaching. You know? That reaching very far. So we are people, I always know that. And that's not a, that's not, that's not, that doesn't have to do with us being racist. We are not. And we, they know that. It has to be with us being real. Things have happened under Haddad that we cannot give him a blight for. He doesn't feel that he has to account to anybody. I've heard of meetings that he, he has come and he's been quite belligerent in those meetings. Um, he doesn't seem that he has to, to, to really advance things in the way that the stakeholders would like. And that's just unacceptable. We talk about 2021. In addition to that, who is he in terms of football? Who appointed him? That's my last question. I had an interview with Andrew Batiste, and I asked him, who appointed him? I mean, at least FIFA would, you would think FIFA being a football and say, okay, they want somebody who is a financial wizard. But we have those who also know the game. We have people without knowledge who also know the game. But you can't bring somebody he knows nothing about football and has the audacity to tell us that Fenwick reports to him in any other country, in the world, somebody else was born in now. If people love football. In a country where people love football. And that is another expression Bertie like to talk about. Somebody else born in now. That somebody who is in charge of football in Trinidad and Tobago could say that the national coach has to report to him or reports to him. But who are you? Why are the journalists in China Tobago afraid to ask these questions? I have a lot of other questions, because eh? I, re I went through his letter. I've seen the, 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 the letter from the stakeholders to him. I have a lot of questions. I want to know who got, what is our interest in this new sponsorship deal? I want to know. BOL. 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 Or BOL who only did. Yeah. Is that where we have reached China Tobago? Yeah. He attempted to explain it uh, in very little detail. In uh, very little detail. <laughs> yeah, I, I want to know more, more about that. I want to know about the funding from FIFA. Whose account does that pass through? The f I, have that, I have that here. The funding from FIFA, Yes. despite $100 million in debt, the funding from FIFA continues. But that is not my question. My question, it goes through which, what account? But, but no, let me just, let, uh, just for, remember, Lima, the funding from FIFA continues. Great. The grant, the grants that FIFA would give the TTFA continues despite. Wonderful. Despite the debt that we are facing, the, million, the multi-million dollar debt we are facing. And into what account does it go? I, I don't know. <laughs> but these are the questions that we need answered. I'll tell you why we need but, answers. But, but FIFA setting up a normalization committee through Mr. Haddad, I suppose they would organize such. Because, because they, they would have taken the power away from the TTFA in its, in its normal running of its affairs. Ah, no, no, no. Wait, wait, wait. Hold up. Now you all getting confused. The normalization committee is the TTFA. It no, is? Don't get, it, it is the TTFA. They are put there to normalize things in China and Tobago. To normalize the TTFA. So they are what we would call the 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 body of TTFA. They might not be the people elected, but they are the TTFA right now. Do, who's TTFA? Who who does FIFA answer to? Remember TTFA um, FIFA answers to MAs. Their relationship is with the MA. So unless 
there's something I don't know or a law that I don't know. He, right now, he is the, if we have a vote to give, who makes that vote? If we have a vote in FIFA, who gives the vote? Who does that? Yeah. He. Exactly. So he is the T -T TTFA for all intents. He's the de facto TTFA. Let me put it that way. He's de facto TTFA right now. So I want to know that funding from FIFA, into what account does it go? Do they send that money in euros, in US dollars? Does he have, what does he do with that? Is he, does he have the latitude, the leeway to use that and give us, and give us, in, and give us in TT? All these kind of questions the stakeholders can be asking. The players can say, no, we want money. You get in paid in US? Your grants in US? You want our pay in US? He has companies. Isn't that a, a conflict of interest? When foreign exchange in China and Tobago is so scarce? All of these questions you guys should be asking. All the stakeholders should be asking. He should be under the fire every second. Unless you all want to go back to the state that we were before. But the stakeholders just keep quiet. The natives on the plantation just keep quiet and let him run. He would love that. These people, I've seen his letter. It's the most disrespectful letter I've ever seen. And I've seen many. That letter is the most disrespectful letter I've seen to, to, from a supposed leader of an organization who, is, who has to account to their stakeholders. He has basically said nothing and said, basically said, you know, take this. And um, that letter was not for the stakeholders. That, that letter was just to show FIFA that he has answered, that he has given some kind of, of answer, token answer. Because it, it contains not, it contains no information that the um, that the stakeholders ask for. He has not dealt with. I mean, I, I we went through the 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 letter that the stakeholders would have sent in detail. It was so many different little points uh, that 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 they were questioning, and some of the questions, very very valid questions of that course. the stakeholders would need. I mean, we are, we are pointing coaches of from from Spain, and, and, and we have no money, and we have no money. So, so I think it's valid question. The technical committee. What is? Uh, I haven't heard from Dion Lafoucard. I mean, he, he has sent a letter on that point. He has sent a letter to stakeholders. Not once mentioned mm -hmm. the technical director of yeah. the TTFA. Mm -hmm. Lafoucard's name was mentioned one time in that letter. So I, I, I just feel, David, at at, at this juncture, <laughs> trying to make goes football is between a rock and a hard place, literally. Because the stakeholders who love, live, and breathe football are at a standstill. Well, I mean, pandemic, besides, besides the pandemic, literally in terms of being able to move forward and plan. One, facing a multi-million dollar debt that we don't have any minds seemingly able to say, listen, this is the direction out of this. We're going to pay right. back. I haven't seen that. The multi-million debt there, I, I'm not, I don't know if FIFA will just wipe that out and then we start from scratch. I don't, I don't, I, I'm guessing, and if I am guessing, we're talking about the whole, all of the stakeholders who love, live and breathe football, guessing as to where our football goes next. Mr. Haddad is there performing a role that he, he, I don't even know if he ever decided he would want to do in his life. And he's there making decisions, signing, doing, let, doing letters, sending out letters to stakeholders who live, love, and breathe this game, and we don't know where to go from here. I am expressing my frustration, and I am, I, I never, I never represent the national team. I, I don't live, love, and breathe football as, as I know stakeholders do day in, right. day out. Well, don't assume for one second that he has been placed, placed in a position that he doesn't want to be. <laughs> That's a bad assumption. That's a bad assumption. Don't portray him as being hapless. Because I, I, I was only, I'm one of the people who said, I'll give him a chance. I mean, his brother was in, in class with me in St. Mary's College. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so I said, you know what? Decent people. They're good boys. Good boys. I know, give him a chance. I know, I know. I, but when I began to see some of the responses, yeah. and hear some of the stories, you know what I mean? It's the same thing all, all is this, over Is his hands tied? Uh, hands tied by who? I don't know. I... I, I I, 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 I told I told I told my producer of it. I said I don't know what questions I ask again because 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 we don't is his hands tied? No, his, no, his hands are not tied. Why, why why this letter with such scant regard for the members of the the, the football in this country, well, the stakeholders of football in this country? As I said to somebody, why not just call a meeting? Well, 
You see, I said that to someone. I said, I remember I said this one time to the African players in Lebanon. They were asking, why FIFA and do something? Why FIFA? And the answer is, FIFA doesn't do anything because they don't have to. You ask any question, if his hands tied, what business of us, the stakeholders, if his hands tied or not, what do we care? What is the problem? Why we have to, to try and psychoanalyze this guy who is in this position, clearly intent on doing things how he wants to do it, in a position that should be democratic, correct? So why the question is, if the question is, are our hands tied? Our, our mouth sealed? We have to do whatever we can to make sure that this thing runs. He does not have to live from this. He can leave the tomorrow and he living fine. From what from reports, independently wealthy. So we have to ask the people who live from this game. Imagine he is in the normalization committee. Have you seen a letter from him? No, with this new lockdown. Advocating for the clubs to have some control, measured control. For the players to trade? Have you seen anything like that? Other than, I, I think he sent a letter to the Ministry of Health or something about when the national team has a game. I mean, he should be a, a prime advocate for the players right now, for grants, or all of that. He should be right there to get some of these people paid. For my accounts, we have only maybe one team paying right now. I think maybe the team that you are associated with, with, this, with this thing, paying their players. But what the other players did, 99% of the players, what, what are they doing right now? So they could be sucking salt, really, and then we're going to ask them to represent the national team? You mean you wouldn't even send a letter? You wouldn't even send a letter to the Ministry of Finance? You wouldn't send a letter to the Minister of Sport saying, hear what, we are players? Because our, most of the players who play football, they're on the low income level. So David, let, me, let, me, let me address the question you asked, and, 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 let's, and let's turn it around. I, I asked if Mr. Haddad's hands probably is tied. Are the stakeholders' hands tied? What can the stakeholders do besides write a letter, quarrel, and, 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 and say, Mr. Haddad, what can the stakeholders do? Every, they, they say stakeholders can do so much. The the they, have, they have no power right now. Um, well, well, pretty much like the opposition. David? All they can do is agitate. We could agitate, we could send letters to FIFA. Right now, if the stakeholders truly are not, they are not in, enamored with this guy, they feel that he's not staying the, the football ship in the right direction, they can't rely on a letter every two months and three months. He laughed, they look at his answer. The detail, I saw the letter from the stakeholders. Very detailed. detailed Fear, balance, everything. And look at his look at his answer. Scant regard, as you said. So what that means? Okay, that is on record. Now the stakeholders. Let's see what the character of the stakeholders. Listen, brother. You have no, you don't get no, anything in this world unless you fight it. Anything somebody take from you by force, you have to get it back by force. That is just a fact of life. You know, I, I I have been holding back from saying this, but I but but I feel like if the stakeholders make the wrong move now. Or, or 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 agitate too much, then then FIFA drop the dro, drop the axe again, or, or or threaten to drop the axe again, and then we're trying to make us football. So wait, 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 hold up, hold up, hold up. All of a sudden, FIFA is this impregnable impregnable fortress that nobody could that. Uh, David, when FIFA threatened before this normalization committee to to, to expel trying to make from from football, it sent panic waves through the entire fraternity. Exactly, because they didn't have the... Listen, let me tell you, I'll give you a quick story. We have a final against Martinique. Players have been paid for months. Owed thousands of dollars. Pele was in the, was in the VIP in the, in the airport. We come together as a group. I tell you, with some young players, I had now come as my first... I didn't want to be involved in anything, anything. The old players come to me, Dexter Francis, Marvin Fosten, everybody come to me. David, you have to do this, you have to get paid. I say, oh, 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 leave me alone, yes? I, after so many years, I come back now, having a great tournament. Leave me alone, I want to hear from all of you. Who they send? Answer the cup. By my boy. <laughs> they send him. They send yeah. Answer the cup. Talk to me. You listen to Cookie. I listen to him. <laughs> I bring them together. Jack Warner come, 
He said, we're not playing. He threatened everybody. He said, we're not playing. This is more than the game, you know. After about half hour, we get a call. Prime Minister, the country coming. Patrick Manning. He come in, big entourage. I want to see David Nakhid. I want to see Dexter Francis. I want to see he come. I come, he ain't talking about it. He talking to me alone. I don't know why. I don't want to be, but I ain't it now. So then what Pop Jack probably tell him, talk to Nakhid. David is the instigator. Right. <laughs> I was not. I swear. I, I swear. When I reached in the airport for the, for the tournament, Jack had my car in auto rentals. This used to be auto rentals them time. <laughs> and my envelope with my money. And to his credit, Jack, since the day I leave Trinidad, they stop him in Trinidad. That is always the case. He never once. By the time I reach, I go and pick up my car, my envelope with money inside. He makes sure I do that. When Jack Patrick Manning reached and started a question, we're going, you know, Pele telling us, Pele waiting. I said, Pele had to wait. Them fellas had to get paid. After an hour, we see two bag, garbage bag of money come and they pay the players. So, 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 so bring it back home for me. Because, bring it I mean, back home there. I... It's, it's not up to FIFA. It's up to how much the stakeholders and how far they prepare to go. It has always been like that. When you when you being suppressed, oppressed, it's not up to what the oppressor doing you. It's how far you prepare to go to stop that oppression. It has always been like that. What advice would you give the stakeholders now? Do whatever they need to do to get it done. Because in the end, that as I said to the Caribbean, as, as we spoke before, the Caribbean MA is now. They're happier. They're happy now. American football has gone way beyond them. U.S. football, way. They boast about it. They laugh in our faces. They say we make billions from the Gold Cup. Why, am I, why U.S. scuttle my, my presidency? Because I tell them, I take in the Gold Cup from all of I swear to God, I remember Sunil, Sunil Galati in a hotel in, in Zurich. My dad next to him, and the woman from Tuxan and Chaos, uh, Tuxan and Kekos. And he asked me, well, what's your plan? I gave him all my plans. No problem. He said, oh, well, I'm going to short pants in the chair, Sunil Galati listening. And he said, and, uh, he said well, how about the Caribbean and thing? I said, well, you can't keep the Gold Cup. You cannot keep the Gold Cup. You have to share that now with the Caribbean. We need to make money. He started to fidget. And I know when I realized that was the end. That was it. When I tell him that. Because they have admitted that they have pushed their, their development through the, the billions from the go. They have generated billions and given us scraps here, conquer cap. David, do you have a role to play in, in terms of. My role, I don't see it here, I'll be honest. I don't see it here in Trinidad and Tobago. You see, people try, tend to think that the power is here in Trinidad and Tobago. There is a certain degree of power here. But if you look at what Jack Warner did, Jack Warner realized the power wasn't here, the power was in the Caribbean. It's just that that's a no brainer. I don't understand our people, you know. I really don't understand our people. We're not a confederation of how many? 41? 41 MAs? How many in the Caribbean? 26? 31? 31! Are we not controlling this thing? What well, we have once and he goes by? We are 31 out of 41. Are we not controlling this thing? I ain't talking about Trinidad, but somebody in the Caribbean. They're dictating us. The power is not here. They let you, they let us feel the power is in Trinidad. But Jack, Jack, Jack was, Jack realized the power wasn't here. Jack said you'd be an advisor here. Correct? Where you went? CFU. Nail long CFU. Nail long CONCACAF. Nail long CONCACAF. He get them up in FIFA to do whatever he want until he decided to go against them up in FIFA. That's is, that is what brought down Jack. You have footballing plans, so? Footballing plans? When you say in terms of what? Uh, administrative position? Not here. Caribbean. Not here. Caribbean, maybe. I would be very interested because what will push us forward is not fighting for the scraps here in Trinidad and Tobago. I would love to see somebody come in here who really having the football at heart and do his thing and, and get players interested and motivated. You know what I mean? I mean I'm, as a matter of fact, I tell Ansel, I look at this facility and I swear I'm in a second division team in Europe. Yeah. Fantastic. Fantastic. That's a, that a vision we, we need to have. Every community should have something like this. 
But we have a, a set of people who are stunting and fronting and feeling the big. But the power is in the Caribbean for us. Let's wrap up. Um, the power is in the Caribbean, and I'm hearing that. Um, you're saying the stakeholders need to do whatever they feel they need to do. Of course. Um, no, no. Do you want to give Mr. Haddad an opportunity to... Again? No. Yeah, enough opportunity to do what? I give, any, I give any man who have me in this position and then I chance to do that. Why? What? What do you mean? There's not, there's not a video game, you know. You got next chance and the people, there's not, this people's lives you're talking about here. I meet some young boys before I come in here and answer. I meet some young boys. They don't know the history of football until under the left. They don't, they do not know. When I was growing up playing football, and most of us, I had no players 30, 40 years before who played before me. They don't realize how important that is. You think you go to Pele in, in Brazil right now and ask about Garincha, Dida, all these players, and nobody know about them? Everybody know the history, except your auntie baby. I, I meet some players here, they had they had to go on, on Google. Google, yeah. See, and so you didn't Google, you did not Google in the 80s? No, we didn't. <laughs> <laughs> We still do. Yeah. I knew about Sadi Joseph. Yeah. I knew about Andy and Eddie Alion. I knew about Sadaf Ellis Sadafal. People, great players. Alvin Cohen. I no, they didn't they didn't know players ten and fifteen years before them. Nobody who do they don't know their history. They know where they are. They they have no situational awareness. And all of that they blame on administration. Final question, where do we go from here in terms of Trent Bigo? Because I, I hear you in terms of the wider picture, but Trent Bigo's football really know at this stage. We have to get people in place who are the interests of football. We can't do that, David. Why you can't do that? Because right now there's a normalization committee in, in, in charge. Well, first of all, you have to put things in place to either to get FIFA to rehabilitate or to normalize this normalization committee. So the stakeholders need a voice. They need a voice. They need, they need a voice and they need quite a few voices, but they have to come together. You see, nothing can take place. We, you see, in Trinidad, we always look at things from this end. The power is down here, but we don't have our own power. If we, do not, if we do not like what we see outside there, with the people who monopolize Massey and all of these big names, and if we don't, our buying power, our consumer power is what makes them, not the other way around, we tend, we let the politicians make us feel that they control things. We control things, our buying, so we, the stakeholders in football, we actually have the say. We could shut down, down normalization you know, with a voice. I, I don't want to do it. Because I'd be compromised now as our position. But I know I could do it. I have enough of a, a voice and enough strength to I could get players and say, you know what, we're not playing. We're not playing any football, all the clubs, until we have a proper normalization committee and we want, we want them to have a proper relationship with the stakeholders. But I do, I do I, you, know, I, I, you know what, for once, I'll do what my father always used to say. He said, David, let somebody else do it. That's my father, I tell you that before, he said, and tell my mother, must we talk to him enough and enough, he called me. He said, David, for once, see what other voice comes up. Let somebody else, and I, I, I agree that 100%. Sometimes you just have to keep quiet. David Nakin, um, thank you very much, brother, for I'm a brother. Yeah, Thanks sharing, for sharing, me. sharing your views. We went over time. I showed you pretty still going on board in my ears when we come off. Um, but what has to be said has to be said. Um, I, I think at the most at this juncture, because we've been facing some turbulent times ahead, we, we literally don't know where we're going from here. Um, and I would invite Mr. Haddad, Mr. Lafoucard, anybody on the normalization committee to come and just sit here with us and address the stakeholders. Because I think whatever happens at this stage, the stakeholders need to be properly addressed. This letter, while addressing issues very scantily, I think the stakeholders need and deserve to be addressed. And that's my invitation right here on the Ascension Football Show. We're coming back. In the game with Ascension, what for champion? Ascension! Ascension! Creepy
bothering you? Call Terminix at 672-5007 or 672-0042 or visit our website at terminix.co.tt for a free quote and consultation. Join our fight against pests. Lasso Frame Maritime Limited, the best in marina services. Our facilities, security checks ensures that all vehicles are secured. Our newly renovated bathrooms are always kept in a clean working order. Need repairs and maintenance? We have you covered. Our qualified workmen will get the job done. Boat storages. From our marina, you can easily push off for a family sailing trip. Or out fishing with the boys. Fun DDI experience with friends. Boat repairs, secured parking, extensive camera system, boat charters, boat rentals, down the island parties. Contact us at 1-868-634. 1653 Lasso Frame Maritime Limited The best in marina services Life's better on a boat with brew all right guys just wrapping up with our coach's corner as usual here is ansel elcock
Thanks, Joel. Today we are doing fitness with the ball and without the ball. Today we are doing fitness with Caleb Sage, player from Terminex, Larkata Rangers. In football, other than skill, the top players in the world you need to be fit, you need to be on top of your game. So without, after your team train, you need to do your personal training. And to be on top of your game, you need to be on top of the other players that you're competitive with. So we're going to do some personal drills to work on your legs, to work on your ability and your agility. This one's simple as I showed you before. You're starting at zero and going at 80%. Let's go. Yeah, increase your yeah. increase your speed now, yeah. So every time you go by anyone, you go faster around the cones, you go yeah, low and high, yeah. You have 30 seconds. Alright, so every time you go, you go well basically three times between each row. Alright? And let's go. Go. Good. Good. Well, let's face the ball. Good. Good. I went around twice. Twice. <laughs> Yeah, focus, focus. Good. All right, good. So you see, you're giving yourself extra work. Time you're doing it, you have to focus just in a game. Right? When you get fit, when you get tired, now you have to focus more. All right, breathe. Breathe in and out. Through your nose and let go through your mouth. Yeah, one more in that and then we'll do it with the ball. Right? And go. Good. Good. Good, 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 good. All right, I'm good. All right, take your time, breathe in and out. In the future, when you're doing it, make sure you're seeing the ball, that you're seeing the cone that you're always going to, because you're back going towards the opponent. Yeah, so instead of you going this way, you're back going towards the opponent, with me, I come in this way, so I see him. Yeah, stretching important. The time you time the muscle going up and down, you make sure you stretch your muscles and then so you keep them loose and nice. Now, when you cut him with the ball on them, right. Make sure when you're going around the cone, make sure you cut when you're coming wrong with the ball, make sure you cut with the inside. So you see it, right? Ready? And go. Ball. Good. 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 Press it. Good. 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 Press it. Good. Ah, good. Well done. Good, well. good intensity. Well done. Good. Breathe. Breathe. And five, four, three, two, one. Go. Back here. Good. Ball. Good. Wrong cone. Quick feet. Good. Reset. Good. Wrong cone. Good. Ball. Good. Good. Center. And back here. Good. Well done. I oh, say so yeah, one more and then we move into the other cone, right? Five, four, three, two, one, and go. Good. Back here. Good. Ball. Good. Wrong the cone. Press it in the middle. Good. Wrong the cone. Good. Ball. Good. Wrong the cone. Inside. Good. Middle. Good. And back here. Good. All right. Well done. This was the first part of fitness. And the fourth segment, back to you, John. All right, that's all the time we have for today. The Ascension Football Show continues every week here. Just follow us on all our social media platforms. Um, we want to thank David Nackett for dropping by and giving us his insight. It was a nice little trip down memory lane with him. Hope you enjoyed it. And hope we take heed and figure out, as the stakeholders in football, where we go from here. I'm Joel Villafana. We'll see you back here when we see you back here on the Ascension Football Show.